a, uh, yeah, it's a real privilege to be kicking things off here. Um, and I, I hope I can at least somewhat live up to that, uh, that wisdom theme. Um, I'm going to start the talk by just kind of giving a little bit of context. Uh, I, I hate needles, right? I have a, a phobia about uh, getting my blood drawn. And um, back in 2007, I was, uh, I was a Fulbright professor at the University of Nairobi and doing a lot of research out in rural Kenya. And ultimately, uh, ended up uh, doing some sysadmin work for this local hospital um, in exchange for essentially being able to get an office with some air conditioning. And uh, at one point in time, about three weeks into this, uh, this gig, I had, you know, was approached by these two rural nurses. And, and they said, there's been this massive Matatu accident. Matatus are these trucks that are packed full of people. And, um, and ultimately, they had run out of blood at the local blood bank. And so they desperately needed to um, make it, do an emergency blood transfusion. And um, you know, while I have a phobia with needles, when, when you know, these nurses approach you in rural Kenya and saying, like, look, there's a real emergency, you feel like you don't have much choice. And so you suck it up, and you, you give the blood. And, um, and then you feel really heroic afterwards and tell your story to anyone who'll listen and show off your bruise. Um, and so that's what happened. Uh, and then about three weeks later, a different nurse came into my office and said, hey, we've run out of blood at the, at our, at the local blood bank. We desperately need to do another transfusion. Um, by the fourth time this started happening, like, I started actually looking into what the deal was with blood supply levels in, in rural Kenya. And, and the short answer is that it's a question of latency. Right? Um, the, uh, the, the guys who actually go up and try to check what the blue blood supply levels were, they come up around like once every month. Uh, and so, you know, together with some students from the University of Nairobi, we, we built together this air SMS blood bank system, a system that let these rural nurses text in what the current data was about the current blood supply levels. Um, and we built this beautiful visualization to let the guys uh, at the centralized blood banks across Kenya see in real time you know, what the blood supply levels were across the country, and, and more importantly, where the blood was needed. And I, I felt like this was a very clever solution. Um, the first week, we, had, we got a bunch of press. Uh, you know, it was being used actively. We had all these rural nurses giving us data over their phones. We had the guys at the centralized blood banks constantly pushing refresh and seeing what the, what the data was looking like. Um, you know, I thought this was, this was pretty good. Uh, the second week, we had this thing live, about half the rural nurses stopped texting in the data. And by the end of the first month, virtually no one was using our platform anymore, and ultimately it was deemed a failure. And this thing failed not because of you know, any technical shortcoming. Technically, this thing was rock solid. This thing failed because of a fundamental lack of insight on my part. And that lack of insight had to do with the price of data, the price of a text message. You know, what I didn't understand was that uh, you know, the price of that text message represents a fairly substantial fraction of a rural nurse's day's wage. By asking them to participate in our platform, you know, we were ultimately asking them to take a pay cut, you know, something that, that fundamentally was, was not fair. Um, I was lucky. I mean, it was at the right place at the right time, because my background, uh, as Matt kind of alluded to, was, was looking at you know, large amounts of data, in many instances coming from mobile phones. And so I uh, was in this unique position where I had read-write access to the back-end billing systems of virtually every mobile operator in East Africa at the time. So I, I just wrote a little 20-line Python script, you know, a script that um, for every properly formatted text message with the day's blood supply levels, I would credit that individual about 10 Kenyan shillings, you know, enough to cover the cost of the uh, SMS and like about a penny to say thank you. And literally, for that opportunity to earn you know, one or two cents, uh, virtually every rural nurse re-engaged the platform. You know, it's, it's something now that's being kind of rolled out across East Africa, but more importantly, a switch flip from the operator's perspective, and because they're, they're suddenly starting to get money from the Kenyan Ministry of Health, rather than from these individuals who, um, you know, are, in many instances are making less than $10 a day. And so, you know, these operators, they're desperate for alternative ways to, uh, to, to generate more revenue. And, um, and when word spread that we had built this little platform, you know, more and more operators wanted to, uh, to, to get, you know, to, to get it into their system. And, um, now, you fast forward to today, we've integrated, it's now a little bit more than 20 lines of Python, but we've integrated into the 237 mobile operators uh, across 102 countries. Uh, and what that enables us to do is something that I think is quite profound. 
you know, we have the ability to instantly put money into the pockets of 3.48 billion people in denominations as low as 10 cents and friction free. Um, you know, this is something from my perspective that, uh, you know, I, I think is, 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 is pretty amazing. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're leveraging this infrastructure uh, going forward and, and ultimately what, uh, what my hope for it is, as well as how researchers um, within academia and elsewhere can, can start leveraging the technology. We've just opened our SDK uh, and we have some APIs that uh, will allow anyone to essentially be able to push money to, to any one of these three and a half billion handsets. So my talk today is going to be a bit about um, leveraging that, that infrastructure, but also about the kind of data that we're starting to see in these high growth markets. Um, and, and I'll talk about the, the big data, so the data that I'm used to uh, in, in many instances, which is called CDR, called detail records, data coming from mobile operators. Um, but then I'll also talk about kind of small data, data that from the bottom up, data from individuals like those nurses who are um, providing self-reported data about what's happening on the ground where they are. And then, and then I'll end the talk with uh, a bit about this idea of reciprocity, and specifically the, the idea of reciprocity in, in advertising. So I've been working on uh, mobile phones in, in, in emerging markets now since, since 2004. And you know, the cool thing in 2004 was I could point to this slide and say, look, the same number of people who are um, using handsets in, in uh, you know, the developed world are, are also using it in, in emerging markets. And you know, this slide, I think, is getting more and more compelling every year that I, I give a talk. Um, it's very clear that the mobile phone is an emerging market technology. Uh, it's, it's made in a massive amount of impact in, these, uh, in the lives of, of people living in these countries. And, and you know, the growth is astounding. Uh, there's something like 1.7 phones in Vietnam for every one person, right? I mean, you're seeing you know, uh, penetration that is just, you know, it's, this is the fastest technology adoption in human history. Um, and what's interesting is, like, if you look at those, you know, five billion uh, active subs in, in, uh, in emerging markets right now, a large fraction of them are using those handsets that you probably used 10 years ago. You know, it's that Nokia candy bar handset that sends text messages and, and plays Snake. Right? Um, the reason why billions of people around the world are using that handset today is, is not because of how awesome Snake is, right? It's because these are the cheapest handsets on the market. Um, what's extraordinary, though, is the price point of these Android chipsets and, and the trends that we're seeing just even over the last 18 months. Uh, I was in China a couple months ago. I bought uh, an Android 2.3 phone off, off the line. It had a uh, touchscreen, GPS, Wi-Fi, 3G. Uh, it even had an antenna that you could pull out so you could watch TV. You know, new in the box with the charger, $24. You know, it's extraordinary, right? And so suddenly, you know, this is, this is a, a device that has Facebook on the deck um, and, and ultimately as, is at now pretty much parity with those kind of quasi-dumb phones that play snake in terms of price point. And so I think we are, we are about to see, in fact, we are already seeing it, uh, uh, like a legitimate phase transition uh, where you can actually start seeing these, these billions of people who don't necessarily have a phone that can connect to the web, don't necessarily have Facebook on the deck. Um, you know, the next handsets they're buying are gonna have a camera, you know, are gonna have uh, a, you know, a reasonably high-speed internet connection. Um, and we're seeing that already. I mean, it, you know, now uh, it's the, the most popular operating system in the world uh, is no longer Windows, and that, that uh, happened relatively recently. And it has nothing to do with how great Android is, but it has everything to do with the fact that Android is, is more or less free. So these gray market handsets, essentially, they need to put something on the, you know, on the device, uh, and, uh, and Android is the, has, is the easy choice. Um, if you look at internet usage, I mean, you see a similar trend in terms of the, just like the fact that we're now, uh, the more people than not are, uh, on the internet are, are living in, in emerging markets. Uh, and if you fast forward to, you know, even just in a couple years, in 2016, um, the majority of people on the internet, uh, you know, are gonna come, I think we're gonna see something like 3.4 billion people online actively. More than half of them are gonna come from APAC and the vast majority of these individuals are gonna be accessing the web on their phone. Um, and if you look at what the kind of follow-on ramifications of this Android price point uh, being, 
you know, one, one thing is, is simply just the, the just kind of explosion of social media. Um, you know, this is a chart from, a, I think, a couple months ago. Uh, but what's, what I think is really extraordinary is that by the end of this year, India is going to be the most popular Facebook market in the world. There's going to be more people in India on Facebook than on any, in any other country. Um, and, you know, I think Facebook has this, uh, it's a great PR perspective in terms of this idea of connecting, connecting the world. Um, but I think, you know, in many instances, they can be a little bit uh, disingenuous. You know, you know, this idea of the fact that, you know, these next billion people, you know, they deserve to be connected and we're going to try to do it despite the fact that we'll never make any money. Um, in reality, if you start looking at Facebook's number of users, I mean, the blue line here, uh, you know, they, the majority of people on Facebook lived in the developing world back in, in 2011. Um, and if you look at how their revenue is growing, Facebook's going to earn the majority of their revenue from users in these emerging markets within a couple of years. I mean, so this is something that, again, you know, just like a, a company like Unilever that earns the majority of their revenue from the developing world, all of these big companies are really looking at these growth markets and seeing this, the, the sheer numbers, and it's, uh, it's inevitable that if they don't win in these markets, they won't win full stop. So that's kind of a sense for some of the data. Uh, I want to do a quick overview on CDR, these call detail records, um, just so that we can kind of get on the same page about the types of uh, data out there in these markets. Uh, this is a representation of, uh, I think this was virtually every phone call made in Rwanda over the course of a few years. Um, and you, you, know, you get things like not just uh, anonymized uh, phone numbers, but you get cell towers, uh, you can get, you get uh, handset types, so you can infer things like socioeconomic status. And one of the initial things that we started doing with this data is, is quantifying people's routines and, and then specifically building something that enabled us to uh, uh, identify deviations from routines. And what was, what was cool was, you know, there was an earthquake, I believe it was in, in early 2008, and we could actually start quantifying the, the population's routines. Like, so millions of people were looking at their day-to-day their -day patterns and then we looked at, you know, during the time of the earthquake, a, you know, a huge number of people deviated from their, their typical routine. And the magnitude of their deviation turned out to correspond directly to the distance they were from the epicenter of the earthquake. So what we're using is all these little human sensors to be able to identify exactly within about 20 clicks where the earthquake actually took place. Um, in reality, there isn't a big market for earthquake detection. Right? There's a lot of better ways to do this than, than looking at CDR. Um, but we took that similar type of con uh, you know, algorithm and, and applied it to disease outbreak. Uh, and you know, I, I'm going to kind of briefly go through this, but you know, we were able to show um, how to you know, better allocate malaria eradication resources based on the mobility patterns of people in these different countries. Um, and uh, you know, I, I got an opportunity to, to spend um, you know, a, a long weekend in the basement of the president of Mexico's home during the H1N1 uh, outbreak, where we were looking at um, basically working with the guys from the different operators and trying to see what the, uh, you know, how when he was making a policy decision about closing roads, closing schools, how that ultimately affected the aggregate population level movement and, and ultimately how that changed uh, the, uh, the potential disease uh, uh, dynamics. So that's at least a, a, a flavor for kind of big data. So this is big data coming from um, generally large companies who are in many, and in actually almost every instance, uh, not providing any type of human consent uh, you know, for, uh, for getting people like myself to look at that data, which is, is problematic and we can talk more about. Um. But then there's the small data as well. Right, so um, I was involved in a, in a campaign. Uh, in this case, this was this was a, a, a project with the uh, Rwandan Ministry of Health, where they had virtually every cholera outbreak um, mapped uh, and a time series and, and a magnitude associated with the uh, the event. Um, and we looked at the CDR that I showed earlier, and what was striking was that um, we were able to, you know, with the similar type of that Bayesian anomaly detection algorithm, we were able to figure out where the cholera outbreak was going to take place um, almost a week before the outbreak actually happened. And I think this is a good lesson for why uh, engineers and computer scientists should not be doing epidemiology in isolation. Um, ultimately, what we had 
what we discovered was that uh, we weren't detecting cholera. Uh, people were, their radius of gyration were being reduced, meaning their movement patterns were, um, were becoming much more limited, not because they were experiencing the onset of something like flu-like symptoms, but rather because the roads were washing out. Um, which, you know, and so the, what we had built was a flooding detector rather than a cholera detector. Um, and so if we had this ability to be able to kind of actually actively survey people, asking them on the ground, hey, are you feeling sick? Um, that we would have a, a much better handle on actually what was going on. And we had data coming from millions and millions of people, but we weren't able to kind of make an, appropri you know, a, an appropriate, uh, in we didn't get any type of appropriate insight from what was actually happening uh, because we didn't actually have any, any individual's voice on the ground being heard. Um, and so that was kind of really what started pushing us towards expanding this platform, this data collection platform, uh, you know, outside of just Kenya and then and now globally. Um, and what's striking is, I mean, if you look at the number of people who are, you know, who are mobile phone subscribers on the on the, on the planet today, the ones in emerging markets are spending far more of their relative income on uh, on their phones than than people in this country, anywhere between eight to twelve percent of a mobile phone subscriber's day's wage is spent on mobile airtime. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary how much spend this is uh, relative to how much they're earning. Um, and uh, and that's, that's really problematic from my perspective. So what we're trying to do is figure out mechanisms to reduce that spend, you know, by being able to offset that cost of, you know, using the phone with, uh, you know, by getting these people to take some sort of action. Um, we've, uh, you know, I, We've raised now, I think, you know, over $25 million uh, to build out this infrastructure. Um, we've, you know, as I said, got these connections now with uh, 237 mobile operators. And, and I think what's interesting is that we, you know, we really can start infusing a lot of capital um, into the pockets of you know, virtually half of our species. Uh, you know, here's a death by logo slide. You know, we're using this. For you know, Al Jazeera, for example, just used this system to try to get a sense for what people were thinking about the Pakistani elections. And what's neat is that you know, suddenly people who were you know heretofore invisible to the Al Jazeera audience suddenly got the opportunity to have their voice heard and um, and you know basically get a little bit of airtime in exchange for turning their opinions into news. Um, but as as we kind of are going forward, what I, what we're really looking at is where the the you know the real money is in these markets. I mean, we've got this massive compensation platform, um, and you know there's there's something like a billion dollars that gets spent on market research in emerging markets. So we can get keep getting people to fill out surveys, um, but there's 200 billion dollars being spent on advertising in emerging markets, and um, you know and there and these brands, whether that's Facebook or or you know, Unilever, they're all, they're going after this emerging middle class consumer. So this is Gowry. Um, she, uh, she's a mom of two. She just bought an $80 Micromax uh, Android handset. Uh, she's just gotten on to Facebook. She's, she earns about 30 bucks a day. Uh, and she spends it about $3 a day uh, on her phone, whether it's for data charges, SMS, voice. Um, and she, she wants to start using, you know, her phone more often and, get, you know, get types of content that I think are appropriate, um, you know, that she thinks would be, be a fun thing to, to do. And what's interesting is if you're, whether you're Unilever or Facebook or whoever, um, advertising, especially when you're advertising on these devices, um, you're putting Gary in the similar position to what we were putting these rural nurses in Kenya in, right? So every time she sees a banner ad, that's money coming out of her pocket, right? You know, most of the world is paying for every bite that they consume. And so when you, we want to engage with these people, whether that's to watch a video or fill out a survey, um, you know, that it's, it's ultimately costing them money. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is figure out mechanisms to offset that cost. And if you look right now at, um, you know, the landscape today, you know, there's, I, I said it earlier, there's $200 billion that's currently just kind of flowing into the pockets of the, the people in emerging markets who, who own the billboards in Gowrie's neighborhood, you know, who, who, who own the radio stations, who own the television channels. Um, and it's, it's pretty, you know, from my perspective, it's pretty ineffectual. And it's, it's 1950s style advertising. Um, but digital doesn't really, hasn't at least to date, um, worked in these markets. 
And in many instances, the reason why it hasn't worked is, is because these, these consumers are so data sensitive that they're not going to watch a, you know, a video on their handset because that costs too much money. Um, so you know, what we're trying to do as a business now is to try to figure out how we can actually redirect. You know, if we can redirect half of that $200 billion you know, away from the pockets of the people who own things like billboards in Gowrie's community and directly into the pockets of the very consumers like Gowrie that um, these global brands are trying to reach, you know, we can take what she's spending on airtime from $3 a day and we can reduce it to about $1.50 a day. And we can do that at scale. We can do that for a billion people. And ultimately what that means is that's providing a billion people 5% more money. That's a 5% raise that these billion people can use. And you know, that's, uh, our operator partners love that because that's 5% more money she could use for airtime. Our clients love it because that's 5% more money that uh, you know, she could use for buying mobile apps or shampoo. Uh, but from our perspective, you don't get many opportunities in life to build a, a platform that has the ability to be able to provide economic empowerment on this kind of scale. Uh, and so, uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing if we can actually uh, bring this to life. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nathan. We wanted this series of talks to provoke and provide wisdom and to help us all to think about how our work can impact, and yours has certainly done that. So let's thank Nathan Eagle again, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate it.